So what if I told you that there was a substitute for hormone replacement therapy that was safer, that was cheaper, and just as beneficial for bones? Would you wanna buy it? Probably would. Well, we're gonna go through a product called Fostium. It is a medical food, and I'll explain what that means. I wanna talk about the claims that are on the product's website. I wanna talk about the research behind it, because this is something that I think there is potentially value in, but I don't think we need to go overboard just yet and everybody jump on this product. So stick around. We're gonna go through all of this stuff, hopefully pretty quickly. So there's a product called Fostium, which has some pretty significant claims. On the website of the product, it claims to increase spine bone mineral density by 20% and femoral neck by 16%. Those are pretty big claims. It also claims to improve vasomotor symptoms. So that would be night sweats and hot flashes uh, for people that are suffering from menopause. But I wanna explore these claims because those seem like really, really big numbers. So let's dig into what's actually into this food product. So again, this is a medical food. Uh, it looks a whole lot like a supplement. I'll explain the difference here shortly. And it has a couple of key things in it. The primary thing that it has in it is called genistein. It's an isoflavone. So it is an estrogen-like molecule. So similar to what you would find several different components of in soy. And genistein has been studied actually in a, a number of different ways for both bone health and uh, symptoms of menopause. So there's some re reasonable evidence behind it, but that's the main ingredient here. Other things that it has in it is phosphate, uh, zinc bisglycinate, uh, vitamin D, and uh, vitamin K2 is MK7. Now, one of the things that I'm going to get into here is the, the claims and the information available on the website and how I find them to be frustrating as a provider, and I would also find them to be frustrating as a consumer. Because when you look at this list of these things that are in it, it describes what they are, but it doesn't tell you how much. So I actually had to look pretty deep to figure out how much of these things are actually in it, and I was able to find it. So it also has calcium in it, and calcium as calcium malate, and a little bit of pentacalcium hydroxide triphosphate. So kind of a new one for me. But for the most part, that's uh, 500 milligrams, and those are gonna be you know, kind of typical calciums that you're gonna find uh, that are chelated and probably reasonably well absorbed, which is maybe not too much, uh, maybe too much, depends on the person. 70 milligrams of phosphate, and then 27 milligrams of genistein. Now, this is where I, I get a little confused because I can't tell, because I can't see the label on the bottle, but I can't tell if this is for one serving and you get two of these a day, or if this is in one capsule and you get two a day because you'll see that most of the research is on 54 milligrams of genistein, and this has 27. And if that's the case, then that 500 milligrams of calcium, actually, if we're going to double it, would be 1,000, which is too much for most people. So uh, a little bit unclear here. Zinc bisglycinate, 20 milligrams, that's fine. K2 is MK7, 90 micrograms, which is probably not enough, in my opinion. And then vitamin D, 400 IU, which is probably not enough, in my opinion. Even if you doubled both of those, still better, maybe enough at that point, but it's going to be a variable person by person. All right, now if you go to the product's website, you'll if you look under resources, you'll see this graph and they say 85% of patients increased BMD. Now they are citing a study here and they talk about, if you look at the bottom right corner, you can see the study description, but they don't actually link to the study and they don't actually cite the study anywhere on their page that I could find, also frustrating. But if you look at this, it says that over the course of three years, you will increase your spine, and bone mineral density by 20% and femoral neck by 16%. Those are big numbers, right? They claim here it's a solution for patients intolerant to bisphosphonates and a solution for patients with comorbidities other than glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. Be curious why they, why they claim that right there in such bold letters. Um, but ultimately, you look at this chart and you can see people that are on genistein, you know, going through the roof, people that are on uh, what they would call placebo, calcium and vitamin D, it drops off. Now, We've talked about calcium and vitamin D on this channel before, and usually studies on calcium, vitamin D, and exercise, patients are kind of flat, maybe a little bit lost. To say that they're losing you know, 10%, closer to getting to 15% at three to four years, that's a pretty significant loss, right? So I definitely wanted to look more at this study to figure out what's going on, where are they getting these numbers, and are these real numbers? Um, and I wanted to figure out where these things came from. So I was able to find that study. We'll go over that a little bit later. So then let's talk about the medical food part. So uh, Fostium has on their website a claim about what a medical food is. And they're like talking this up as if being a medical food is a better thing. It's better than supplements because everything is 
GRASS, and GRASS stands for Generally Recognized as Safe. It's an FDA statement because these are all things that have been FDA researched to be identified as generally recognized as safe. But you got to dig into the, the science here. So before I get there, they're separating themselves from supplements because they want to stand out from the crowd. And they're going to be called a medical food and you have to have a prescription to get it. But is it really different from a supplement? And the thing is, is when you look at the details of what a generally recognized product is, it can either be studied or it can be claimed to be safe based on studies. So somebody can basically say, yeah, it's safe. This is the study that shows it. And so is that different than an over-the-counter supplement product where the things that they're putting in their products still have to be recognized as non-harmful? It is different, but how different? I don't know. I've never made a product like this, but my guess is that really this is a marketing thing. They're just trying to stand out and using the FDA as a, as a tool to potentially do that. But uh, I'm not really impressed. And I think it makes it more complicated to get the product because you need a prescription. Although I'll talk about that in a second. So if you want to get this product, Fostium also has a way for you to get a prescription from a system that they have either partnered with or set up. And it talks about, uh, you know, Medicare is included and everyone can get this and it's $44 a month. And, you know, that's actually not very expensive from a, a quality supplement perspective. So maybe this is a, a really good thing. They're trying to, to uh, provide this for folks. The challenge that I have with this is that whenever somebody defines a problem, creates a solution and then sells it, I feel like there is a business model in there that I feel like is a little bit biased. Uh, maybe it's altruistic, hard to know. But before we dig into the actual claims of the studies, uh, let me just mention this real quickly, that if you're finding value in this type of content, please just do me a favor and click the subscribe button. And if you want to learn more about other tips and tricks of managing osteoporosis, look for our link for the masterclass in the description below. Uh, totally free to you, opportunity for you to ask us questions and listen to me walk through kind of the research and some of the basics about how we manage osteoporosis and how you can do a lot of these things on your own at home. All right, so let's dig into this research. So the first trial that I have here is from 2007. I think this is the study that they quote in here, although I have some questions about that. Again, they didn't cite that study, so I had to go find this, but they did mention that there were 389 women and that it was a randomized placebo-controlled trial. So I found a study from the same year that had 389 women that was a randomized placebo-controlled trial. I'm assuming it's the same one. What's interesting about this study, though, is that it only goes out for two years and their chart on the website goes out to three years. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe they did a follow up study. But again, this was studied or this was published in the same year. So I don't know. Uh, but it was an interesting study because it had, again, 389 women, reasonably well designed. It had two arms. It had a placebo arm and the placebo arm was calcium and vitamin D. And then it had a genistime arm, which was calcium, vitamin D and genistine. But again, at the 54 milligram dose, not 27 milligram dose. I actually had to, to find the article and then I had to actually get behind a paywall. So I had to pay to get this article to look at the data, which is also frustrating for me because I feel like this should be made publicly available or relatively easy access. And I have access through multiple institutions and yet I still had to pay directly to get this article. So I was able to find the data and here's what these data show. The data show that actually for the, at 12 months uh, for the femoral neck, the increase in bone mineral density was 2.3%. And at the spine, it was 2.8%. So it's still good, but it's not 20%. It's not 15%. And then at 24 months, it was 5% and 5.5% femoral neck and spine BMD. So you know, like, gosh, well, how did they get those big numbers? Well, they either extrapolated or I'm missing the, the study, but they may have extrapolated this out to three years to say that if you continue this curve, you're going to get to three years. And then they also looked at the difference between their improvement on genistine and the difference between this and placebo, meaning that not from zero, but from placebo because placebo was getting worse. And I already mentioned that placebo got like oddly worse, right? In the calcium and vitamin D group, they lost 2.4% of the hip in 12 months and 5.5% at the hip in 24 months. That's a big drop, actually. So I wouldn't expect that uh, somebody who isn't, who doesn't have some cause, secondary cause of osteoporosis to lose that much bone. Same thing, spine 3.3 and 6.3% in 24 months. That's a big drop. So then, so that got me thinking about why would this group do that if they were on calcium and vitamin D? And I have a thought, but before I get there, I wanted to mention that the negative side effects and the dropout rate from this study were pretty significant. So the side effects from taking this product were close to 20%. They, they rated a 
uh, GI side effect rate, so there's uh, upset stomach, nausea, et cetera, um, and the dropout rate of almost a quarter of the people in the study. So uh, a quarter of people is uh, pretty high. You always lose people, but 24% is pretty high. So, right, so let's talk about the placebo group. So the placebo group, this is what they were told to eat. It says all participants were counseled on an isocaloric reduced fat diet composed of 25 to 30% energy from fat, less than 10% energy from saturated fat, 55 to 60% energy from carbohydrates and 15% energy from protein with cholesterol intake less than 300 milligrams and fiber intake of 35 grams per day or greater. So, and then they talked about the equation, the Harris-Benedict equation, where they we actually figured out what the uh, calorie count should be. So I'm gonna just summarize that. This is a high carbohydrate, low fat diet with pretty low protein that is also um, cholesterol restricted and calorie restricted. So my opinion of this type of diet for somebody who wants to improve muscle mass is that this is the wrong diet. If you wanna improve muscle mass, if you wanna improve bone health, you're calorie restricting, you're not consuming protein, and you're getting carbohydrates from who knows what sources. This sounds like a terrible idea. And if you look at the results, it is a terrible idea. Their bones got significantly worse. And I'll tell you probably the primary reason why. When you use this Harris-Benedict equation, you come up with the, the basal metabolic rate, which is the number of calories that you burn just sitting around being you. And then you increase that by a multiple. So I use the light to moderately active multiple. And that gives a 60-year-old that is 5'2 at 130 pounds a calorie count between 1,700 and 1,900 calories, which is not actually that low, to be honest. But even at that calorie count, at 15% protein, that's 60 to 70 grams of protein a day. That's just not enough. So they probably need double that much protein. I think that is going to play a significant role here. Uh, and why the people in the placebo group did so poorly. So, all right, so that's the Genistein alone study. So I have a second study here that is Genistein and hormone replacement therapy. And this is actually uh, from 2002. So this actually preceded the, that study. Okay, so let's talk about this Genistein versus hormone replacement study. So this is a nice head-to-head. -head. There were actually three arms, placebo, hormone, Genistein. The HRT group was one milligram of estradiol, which is a, a patch, and it's a kind of a middle of the road dose and it was combined with a progestin so a synthetic progesterone and then genistein again at 54 milligrams and placebo that was on it seemed like nothing they didn't mention calcium and vitamin d which is surprising but anyway in the results the bone turnover marker so a, a bone turnover marker for bone breakdown uh, was reduced by both genistein and bhrt so both were slowing down bone loss genistein increased bone building according to the biomarkers, but HRT did not. It did not change these biomarkers. Now, actually, I don't use these biomarkers. They're different from the ones that I use. So I wonder how sensitive those are. Uh, from a bone mineral density perspective, at 12 months, there was an increase of 3.6% for genistein and 2.4% for HRT. So genistein outperformed HRT at the hip, but HRT outperformed genistein at the spine. 3.8% to 2%, so almost double at the spine, which is, we see this often with estrogen. And then the placebo went down 1.6% down on the spine, which is what you would kind of anticipate from a placebo perspective, especially if they weren't on calcium and vitamin D. But here's the thing. So diet in this study was similar to the diet in the other study. So I'm just going to read you again what they were on. They received dietary instruction for an isocaloric fat-restricted diet offering 30% energy from fat, less than 10% from saturated fat, and cholesterol intake of less than 300 milligrams per day. So they didn't actually say that they were restricted in protein, but they were restricted in dietary fat, which usually will also restrict protein um, just by default, because especially animal fat comes, sorry, animal protein comes with, with dietary fat. So they may have, but again, it's harder to get protein. So who knows? Maybe that was a reason for them losing more than I would expect. So what does all this mean? Well, let's just review what we talked about. Genistein is a soy isoflavone. The Fostium product actually is a non-soy version, so it's a kind of a synthetically produced genistein, which doesn't come from soy, for better or for worse. It acts similar to a CIRM or a selective estrogen response modifier. In fact, one of the things I didn't mention earlier is that they have claims on their website that show that it is more specific to one estrogen receptor over another, and they actually claim that the CIRMs, which would be raloxifen, tamoxifen, the CIRMs are more likely to cause breast cancer because they are more responsive to the other receptor than is genistein. I just published a video talking about raloxifen and bone and how it's protective of breast cancer. So that doesn't make sense to me. Maybe there's something that I'm missing there. 
Um, anyway, Fostium has genistein in it and all the nutrients that I described earlier, but at questionable doses. It is a medical food, but is that really better than a good quality over-the-counter supplement? I would argue it just makes it harder to get. The question really is, is it better than HRT? I think that it is not better than HRT, in my opinion, for most of my patients, because I would rather than be on the things that we have more studies on, that we have more predictable data on, uh, because I want to know what's happening from an estrogen perspective, from a testosterone and progesterone perspective, if we're using them all. There is maybe a role, but I know that based off of the studies on HRT, that HRT will increase bone mineral density by 3 to 4% in pretty much every study that it's been studied in. It will decrease fracture risk, and we don't know that that's true for genistein. Uh, we also know that progesterone and testosterone will play a role in bone health, and when you combine all three, you have a powerful trio. Genistein doesn't do that. There are also no big studies, and this is where I get frustrated when people say, well, there are so many risks to estrogen. Well, it's because we have studies with, with hundreds of thousands of people in it. When you get studies that big, you start to pick up on very, very minute risk. The biggest study I found here was on 300 something people. So we don't know. So you're actually trading a known risk for an unknown risk. Is that better? Maybe. Depends on where you are with estrogen and whether or not you're a good candidate for estrogen. I really feel like for me, if I'm going to recommend this product, it's going to be for somebody that is not a candidate for estrogen. Maybe that's because of a family history. Maybe it's because of a previous diagnosis of breast cancer. Maybe it's just because they are just simply uncomfortable with estrogen. And then maybe this is something that we could potentially use. And I can think of a few patients that are in that boat that I, I might actually introduce this product to because it is doing something. But I would not recommend it as a replacement for HRT. I think HRT is probably going to be more powerful. Now, as far as the website claims, I know marketing is marketing, but I do think it's misleading to say that there's a 20% increase in BMD. That's just not true. I think they extrapolated that third year and they're also saying different than a group of people that lost a lot of bone, uh, not from zero, meaning that they, they're, they're doing the difference between the up and the down of that chart and the difference between the two. And I don't think that that's very, very honest. I also think that they that diet that they put them on is really misleading and it's i would i would consider that an unethical diet to put somebody on that wants to actually improve bone quality and muscle mass but that's me so anyway i hope you found this helpful uh, maybe shed some light on this product genistein and fostium uh, maybe it's right for you i think it is not a replacement for hrt is, is the big takeaway if you haven't already and you find value in this uh, channel please click the subscribe button it really helps me to help others to educate them on all of the various things that we talk, talk about with bone health. Um, if you haven't yet, look for the link for our, dis, uh, our free ebook in the description below. Um, you can download the ebook as a PDF, or you can go to Amazon and buy the book um, and uh, get the, you know, it's 150 pages, simple read. Um, you can get that book and read through it. It's our, basically our starter guide. If you are new to osteoporosis or stuck in osteoporosis, highly recommend reading it. It's a simple, easy read. It's a jumping off point to then figure out what is next for you. And that's it. Thanks so much for making it to the end of this video, and I will see you next time.